We're moving into item 3.7 for information. Presentation of the 2018-19 general operating budget. Mr. Cooper. Well, good evening. As, as you know, at this time every year, I come to you with the budget for the next year. Uh, I think I'd like to start with just a quick review of your timeline and, and where you're at there. We did our budget workshop back on the 16th of uh, April. Uh, tonight we're here for the proposal or the proposed 18-19 budget and then the public hearing to follow directly after. Uh, and then again, we meet twice in June for the board. Uh, you meet again on June 25th. You'll do two actions there. Sometimes it gets confusing, but we will adopt this 18-19 budget and you will approve the final budget amendment to 1718. And of course, it just starts the cycle then because then the audit will happen in the summer and we'll start on and, and move forward. And, and of course, the 1819 budget will also reflect any adjustments we need along the way. I always like to remind people the budget's not really advisory in nature. Uh, for a public entity, the state requires we have it in by July 1st. It also requires that we reflect where do we get our resources from, where's the revenue coming from, and how we're spending it. So anytime there's a change along the way, whether... Uh, we get a grant someplace along the way. We do amendments, and typically, as you know, we do those in March and in June. Uh, and then, of course, the audit is our final say when we get, we get all finished there. All right, well, one of the most important things we have to do at a budget is to set the millage rates. And while the first one's not a surprise, 18 mills on the non-home, uh, excuse me, on a non-homestead property is uh, what we've been levying for a long time here, uh, and it's what you can levy. The next one, the 1.6814 mills on Homestead, that's our hold harmless uh, millage. If you recall, um, set uh, back uh, when Prop A came in, uh, you could raise $415.31 a student. So there's two things that I have to do every year, and that is take, take the current taxable value, have to take the estimate of the number of students we have, and figure out how, much, how many mills we can levy. Every year we can come back and adjust that um, because, of course, it's an estimate both on the taxable value when you're doing this in June or May and, again, when you get into the school year and, of course, the number of students will be a factor. Uh, the other thing that's been a factor lately is the personal property tax, which is slowly being removed from what's the taxable value and when that happens, it changes a little bit. This happens to be slightly down from a year ago. Uh, it was at 1.7100. Um, of course, in the city, all these millage rates get split in half because well, I want you to recall within the city limits, we do two tax levies in the summer and the winter, and in the, in the county, outlying county areas, um, we just do once a year in the winter. The other thing is our bond uh, millage rate. Uh, if you remember, it started at uh, 2.95, uh, went to 284. Well, this year it's at 272, and it's going to remain at 272. Um, we don't... Uh, I'm no expert at that. We have financial advisors that look at where we are. They look at the taxable value and how much it's grown. They, they know where we stand with the bond and the repayment of the bond. And then they determine what that millage rate is that you should issue for that year. So this one has to be the same. If uh, looking at the material they sent me, I would just tell you that the taxable value um, that's not a bad thing. Um, because, as you know, when that personal property tax comes out, uh, that actually, for a long time, they were predicting it would cause the taxable values to drop. The real property is kind of catching up with it. So it's growing. I think it was 0.35%, though, but that's not, not huge. So um, it's the exact same bond rate. And, again, that would be split just like um, anything in the city is. So those are the millage rates that we have in this bond or in this uh, budget, excuse me. Uh, there's some major assumptions that we have to make all the time, and the first one's with, of course, the part of the formula we don't control, and that's the state aid. Um, we do know they're very close, but uh, like close is like tomorrow is what I heard, which doesn't help us when we're meeting tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so the state aid formula, uh, our major assumptions from the state is it will be a 2x formula. I used 115 per student, uh, which would take us to $8,526 a student. The 115 looks like it will be 120 when the budget finally goes through. That's a small enough amount. When we get to adjustment time, we'll just adjust it. Um, but it looks like it might be $5 more per student when the state finishes with that. Not that the 20M funding rolled in means much to anybody, but once in a while as we go through this, 
Uh, we get so much per pupil, but part of it is sometimes made up out of another fund, this 20M, and it's due to a f uh, kind of a complicated formula, but it was where inflation was not going to allow us to get the same uh, increase this past year as other school districts would get. And so they put the extra funding, which happened to be $6 a student. Uh, it's only important when they don't leave it in there. Uh, and we've experienced that in the past a couple of times where they've put it in that way and then said, oh, by the way, you don't get to keep that. And so the next year when everyone else is getting the increase, you don't get the same amount because you're not adding it on to the same. So uh, the big difference here is whether they consider us making uh, $8,405 a year per student this year or is it $8,411, and they rolled that in. So that $6 per student stays with us. So it is kind of important. Uh, there's no change in shared time or there are non-public K funding. That could have meant thirty or 40000 but it looks like they're not going to touch that. We do provide some services to our uh, non-public parochial schools, and there was a lot of talk early on that they would not allow us to do kindergarten anymore. Kindergarten has been one of those outside of the public schools where uh, for a long time they wouldn't let us do it, then they let us do it. So it's been one of those going back and forth. The other part of state aid is categorical. That, those are in categories of where they give you funding. Um, last year, if you remember at the start of the year, we really didn't know where we stood on 31A, but by October we knew. Um, we're expecting the same thing. Um, it's 30% of what we'd normally get because we're a hold harmless district. So if, when you see the amount of money, which last year, 500, I think, Brian? Yeah, just, just a little bit more than 500,000. That's about 30% of what, if we looked at all of it and did the formula, we, we, we would receive if we weren't a hold harmless district. But we expect that to stay. And the other thing that got added late last year, uh, after we had already put a budget in, was the high school uh, per pupil bonus. They added $25 per high school student uh, to the funding mechanism, and that's staying. So we have both those. Uh, other major revenue assumptions on the state aid, and, and again, not to, there are enough numbers that they would scare you here, but these two, the 147s, deal with the retirement. And the state's done a couple different things. Uh, there's a 1 and a 2, 147A1 and 147A2. And then there's a 147C1 and a 147C2. Um, in essence, one of them caps it, so we only have to pay up to a certain amount. The other one is like an assist to us to help pay uh, the parts we have to. And then they added a couple in the last couple years, um, uh, one that uh, helped pay because the rate of return has been changed at the state level. And so they needed to pay that off. And the other one, which is no longer there, the 147C was a one-time only. And that had to do with the uh, buyout the state did, uh, increased retirement, uh, I think it was three or four years ago now, when the state changed their multiplier. So um, they're still there. It's always important. Doesn't mean a whole lot to anyone else, but it, that was one of the issues until the state stepped in that was causing budgets a lot of problem was the retirement system and the percentage that districts were having to put in. So them capping it, them supplying the money, if those two categoricals ever went away, it would be very noticeable in school districts across the state. So it's important to know there's, there's a lot of money there. They're in and out monies. In other words, they give it to us, and then we pay back to them for the retirement. Um, but it's better than them not giving it to us. Mm -hmm. So just it's important to keep that in mind. Uh, it looks like, though, this latest conference looks like they might add a couple of these back in, but there was no uh, uh, my STEM or the 104D grant or the 35A, which is uh, early literacy, but it looks like they might be funding those to some level. We'll have to add those at amendment time, but it wasn't very clear. The, the three different branches, the Senate, the House, and the Executive, were not in agreement on, on what should happen with those. Of course, we have to make some assumptions on the revenue on our own. And the other big factor is not just the funding per pupil, but it's the enrollment. So, of course, we do use consultants, and the consultants are telling us that um, we should lose approximately 53 students, that we would have a blended count of 7,634. You know, the last couple of years, um, the consultant's been wrong in a good way for us. We've had more students than that. Uh, I really do hope the trend continues. It's not a bad one. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you've been here long enough. You've seen it go the other way, too. This is just their best prediction of, of where we should be. And again, it's, it's the, the birth rates aren't changing very, very much. And they have decreased in the last few years. And that's, that's what you're seeing. But that's where we're at. 
There were trig grant, uh, technology grants in there, and we've basically uh, spent all those, especially when the state was changing to online testing. Mm -hmm. They were providing a lot of money that we were able to use, and of course, that's now done, so we don't have any. Um, the one thing that is nice, um, we have been increasing our interest revenue. It's coming back to what it was a long time ago, but for a long time, the, the return you could get on your money was not very good. So if you're seeing, I know what's not a whole lot, at least wanted to let you know that, you know, it's 65,000 more than we, we've been getting in the past. So it, it is growing what you can get on your money as it sits and, and, and waits. Um, and I also wanted to put in there the passage of the countywide enhancement millage. While this one coming up really would affect the following uh, time, I, I do think it's important to let everybody know that that is an assumption. It's a it's a pretty good size of money, anywhere from uh, three and a half to, to four million, as far as Midland is concerned itself. And of course, the other county schools are also not getting that much money because it's done on a per pupil basis kind of thing and in your percentages. But it is an important part of what we do. So a couple of things just to give you some background on it again with those revenue things. I just wanted to show you the enrollment to give a little history. And of course, I provided that too in the budget narrative so you could see it. But um, basically, I, I've left 2008-9 uh, there because that's the last year we got 20J. So it's kind of interesting to go back to that time. That's when a lot of the financial things started to hit us a little bit. And look at enrollment. Um, again, 1819 is an estimate based on everything we know. I think you'll see special ed stayed uh, somewhat consistent. Secondary has had to take some of that drop that's been coming through the elementary schools for quite a while. I think the one interesting thing is if you look at between 16, 17, and 17, 18, uh, and wondering this year, how did we beat the estimates? Because as you remember, we were supposed to lose about 50 or 60 kids. You'll see that um, the elementary enrollment actually went up, uh, which is a little unusual, but I think with opening new schools and doing the new construction, that uh, I'd have you take a look at, so. Um, enrollment another way, sometimes I think the line graph shows you a little better. Uh, we were on that downward hill for quite a while. You'll see basically, it's really between 13, 14 was the last time we had one of those bigger drops, but it was pretty consistent there, and uh, the big difference is we've been able to stabilize it. If you look at the end of that graph, it's when you stabilize the enrollment, it makes it much easier to budget and predict what's gonna happen uh, and follow from there. So that's, that's been a nice trend in the last four to five years. Uh, when you look up our, our per pupil funding, um, again, uh, we'd be looking at 8,526. If we get five more dollars, we'd be looking at 8,531. I wanted to point out to you back in 8-9, we were getting 8,904. So um, this is one of the bigger increases this year that, than we've seen in a long time, and that's a good thing. Um, but there's a way to go even to get back to where we were in 8-9. Uh, the way this goes, they do look at what your local millage can provide and um, what your local tax base is, and the state makes up the difference after that to get to your per, uh, per pupil funding on that. So um, it does vary from year to year. Um, I think the biggest thing that we've had lately has been that personal property tax, Midland County, and where the middle public schools sit, there's quite a bit of personal per, uh, property tax out there, and that's been as it's been removed and not taxable. Um, it's dropped the local share just a little bit, but still Midland is a heavily locally funded still, even um, by state standards. All right, so we're looking at, a, in this budget, uh, the revenue at 81,716,910. And like I said earlier, you can really see um, about 66.5% of it's out of the state, a little bit of federal. Uh, that transfers is, includes our uh, enhancement millage. So I just wanted you to know where that came from, your local property tax and other local revenues, which can be grants and, and other things for the local revenues. You can, you know, uh, revenue from uh, um, anything that we charge for, but it also can be uh, local grants, like some of the STEM grants we've been receiving. We also have to make some expenditure assumptions on this. We have continued, if you remember, we call it our balance, our budget process. Uh, we've been trying to maintain billing and departments close to the levels. You'll see it's gone up. You can't stay at those levels forever. Um, there are some of those things that we do have to spend, so we just try to be diligent about where we let the resources go uh, to help us meet what we're doing. There's an approximate 1% salary increase uh, for all employees. Uh, I think Mike said it well in the salary letter. There are a couple places it changes a little bit, but, but it's there. 
And we do have step increases. People tend to forget that because we did freeze for a while. Step increases are as people get experiences, there are scales that they move on, and that does make a difference uh, in where we're headed, so it's important you know that. Uh, the medical premiums, 10%. Um, I know in some cases you might have read that maybe we should go higher, but I'd want you to know that where our medical premium comes due, it's in January. So the 10% is really to help us get through um, half of a year, not a full year. And we do have a 5% envision. Uh, we're still contributing the same level for the employer's share of the HSA contributions. And when we staff, we always try to look at it in terms of do we have replacements we need, reductions, or is there something additional we need? And by watching the staffing numbers closely, that helps us too. Um, working. All right, so what I have here in the chart is just our best right now, remember, is our March estimate. So that first column is just where we stood in March. You've seen all that before. That's just our best estimate in 17, 18, where we are. The new budget is the bolder column, second column in, and it's showing you where we are estimating and where we say the 18, 19 budget will spend its money. Um, as you look down there, you'll see that the total expenditures are going to come to $80,644,747. Um, these are done by different categories here. You'll see salaries, benefits, and so on. I will say there's one thing about the salaries where you would expect them to go up more than you see there. Don't want you to forget in this year's budget uh, was also the year we, as our people came out of concessions, we had uh, the budget surplus protection checks that we issued. That was in the budget. So I would tell you salaries did go up more than 30000 with that. Um, you'd have another, I'm going to guess, 400000 that would have been there, but it was already in the budget, which typically you would not have that amount already contributed to salaries. But that comes from, from where we stood coming out of this one. Benefits, like I said, are up there. Purchase services and contracted services in a budget this side, that's not a lot of differences. You can see on the supplies where it's gone up a little bit. We talked about that. You'll see it's up just a little bit. Um, some of the capital outlay just depends on what we're doing at that time. I'm sure some of that also is down because of things that we're doing with, with bond funds too. Um, leases just depends what we're looking at or gifts. Uh, that category covers a lot, the other. So it could be that our leases are down because we're not doing copiers, but the contributions that we're getting, the gifts from outside could be up because we're getting some of the STEM grant. All right, and so again, you see just a slight change on the expenditures from where we currently are. Bob, when we look at the benefits, um, that's the, the big change there is the health insurance. Yeah, it would be that 10% uh, 10 increase. 10%, right. In there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have to be a little careful like on HSAs too because the way we fund those, um, uh, you, you get two, two times, but we do allow employees to draw if they've spent the first half of the deductible. So you actually have to budget. So that's more like a little lower than you would expect, even with the 10%, because you do have to budget in case they were to draw or, or, had, the, or had the need to draw early. So, yeah, that would be basically be the increase in the medical cost of the plan. And, again, we won't know that for sure until we get closer to January. So we want to budget a little carefully to, to make sure we can cover it. Could it be higher? Could it be higher? And when we see those leases, like the copy machines, that really helps us. The bond has helped us out tremendously Very much in so. order to yep. um, see these numbers. Uh, so then again, it's the $80,644,747. Um, if you look at it, this one is by account number. So it it's, um, doesn't change much. That 85 to 86% kind of goes to our employees. Again, we are a personnel business, and that's the way it is. And so you'll see salaries, FICA, retirement, medical, other benefits. The other, about 14%, not very big, but it's purchase services, contracted services, supplies, et cetera. Another way to look at those expenditures, uh, same amount, guys. It's just a different way to look. If you want to know where your money goes, you can see, again, I think we've talked about this a few times, try to keep it close to the classroom, student support, instructional support, um, smaller amounts going to maintenance, transportation, administration, et cetera. This is an impressive pie chart. I always like looking at that and seeing how much uh, of our funds are staying in the classroom and around yeah. our students. Um, just the general fund snapshot that I know you like to see. Again, the first column is where we stood in March with our estimate. And again, for our budget, what we're projecting is the 81 million, 
uh, for budgeted revenues, the 80.6 for budget expenditures. Uh, that looks like we will still have excess revenue uh, of about just a million. Um, you'll look down and we do have a budget variance. We basically have always put that in there as 1%, but you know, historically that can vary from two to three. Um, it just depends on, as we close out the books for this year, who's spending money where, and while we can have a good idea, this is a big organization, it's almost impossible to pin that down. And I've seen it both ways, but two to three is more like someplace in there. One keeps you safe so you know where, you, where you've been. So that surplus with the variance, if we get that variance, would be 1.8, almost 1.9. And then the difference there, I want to make sure um, our unrestricted fund balance uh, is looking like 15.7, uh, which is 19.5%. Now, that's the unrestricted part, because remember, it's very often I'm showing you the fund balance, which is going to be much higher. And then there's, uh, there are things in there that have been restricted, and then there have been things in there like things we've bought already and the money sitting there. Or there's also um, all the donations that we get. So the STEM grant can't be spent that way. So I'd like to show you the unrestricted um, because the if you just take the total fund balance, it would be closer to, to 22%. Right. Um, but a lot of that is that STEM grant that's sitting there that we're using for everything that we're doing over the next uh, eight years, ten years, however long uh, that goes forward. By the way, if you remember, too, a lot of our contracts were on the basis of they gave us protection on where our fund balance was. And to get the 1%, it had to be 16. So you're seeing that we're going to make that, which is good for our employee groups. So that's a good thing. And so that's there. Just a little general fund history. Just because it felt so positive, I had to put something there to remind <laughs> us all how we got here. And that's just part of what I have to do, but, you know, if you go the last few years and you're just looking for where does that revenue bar exceed the expenditures? So for the last four years, looks pretty good. Uh, I want to remind you that if you go back before that, you'll see there was a run of we weren't. That's how you got through this is by keeping a healthy fund balance. It's what got you here. And it got pretty close a couple times in there. Just wouldn't want you to uh, ever forget that. I want to be pessimistic and I, mm -hmm. you know, it's, we're not a bank. We're not trying to save everything, but by the same token, it got you through some tough times. And I think that's always important to, to remind you for. And um, I think we're, we're working hard to, to get a healthy one. And then of course, spend it wisely uh, uh, where it makes the most sense. Well, it really shows us how important that enhancement millage is too. Yep. Yeah, because that loss uh, right away would send you the other way. Um, again, different picture of the same thing. This is an unrestricted um, fund balance. So this, excuse me, this is the um, full fund balance. So it just shows you a little different, but it just shows you again in, in dollars if you're reading the scale on the um, left-hand side and the percentage that represents. Um, and you can see that, you know, when, when you having the most trouble was in this area, we had a couple little runs and a little peak. Uh, along the way here, sometimes it was the federal money that came in that peaked us for a little bit and then back down. But um, you can see we've had a healthy trend back up. Other thing I would also tell you is, of course, that um, we do moving into the next budget year. Uh, we have settled contracts with all the employee groups, but it's also the ending year for many of those employee groups. So the other thing is it's nice to have the fund balance there so you can work forward as you, as you uh, work with those groups. Well, maybe one of the more vital ways to look at a fund balance is how many days you can operate, and we're a little over 60, but remember we do go 30 some days without a payment from the state, and so anytime you dip below 30, you'd be in the borrowing mode, so. Right. The other thing is the fund balance is so important with aging buildings and mm -hmm. the possibility that, you know, a transformer or whatever it was at Dow that went out last year that was such a big ticket item that was totally unexpected. So we have to have that covered. And with the, uh, younger educators and knowing that we're going to continue to grow. This is the lowest your salaries will ever be. So, we, you know, with that changeover we've had over the last two or three years, it will only go up. So. Wow. Thank you, Bob. You're welcome. <laughs> it was good to go over this in FFO and get a lot of questions asked as well. And then uh, the, all the slides and detail were in the, the board packet, which we've had for a while to really look over. So I appreciate all your work and getting that information out to us. Don't do it alone. I always want to tell you that the business office, um, with Lori Holderby and everybody back there, um, they're the ones that do all the, 
all the hard work and uh, pull us through that with uh, just a very few people doing a, doing a lot of work back there. Thanks, Lori. <laughs> yes. Well, now I believe we go into public hearing yep. for this. And Correct. I had something I had to read, I believe. I'll go ahead and read uh, from the June 11th letter for the operating budget. Sure. Uh, Michigan Public Act 621 of 1978, the Uniform budget, uh, Budgeting Act requires all local governments to adopt balanced budget in a format specified by the state before July 1st of each year. In addition, Public Act 4 of 1995 also requires a local unit of government to hold a public hearing on its proposed budget and state in part that property tax millage rate proposed to be levied to support the proposed budget will be subject of the hearing. The initial portion of the June 11th board meeting has been designated as a public hearing on the PA 621 budget. Do I have anyone that would like to come forward and uh, speak on behalf of the budget? No one? Okay. 